The case of Nietzsche's syphilis diagnosis is a cautionary tale for the ages. It is an illustration of the mercurial tendency for truth to slip between our fingers. As Leonard Sachs puts it in his pivotal article on Nietzsche's syphilis, one man's gossip becomes another man's reference, which in turn becomes a scholar's footnote. In this episode we're going to look at how Nietzsche got misdiagnosed with syphilis and how this misdiagnosis became entrenched in the history books. We're also going to look at the alternative explanations proposed for his descent into madness. On the 3rd of February 1889, Friedrich Nietzsche was accosted by two policemen in the Italian city of Turin, where he had been living since April of the previous year. According to popular legend, Nietzsche broke into tears at the sight of a horse being whipped and ran over to it, crying, threw his arms around its neck. This event has become enshrined in the Nietzsche myth, but in reality it never happened. The anecdote has been shown to have zero basis in fact and bears an uncanny resemblance to an incident in Fyodor Dostoevsky's Crime and Punishment. What we do know is that Nietzsche had a breakdown in Turin's Piazza Carlo Alberto and he was escorted back to his lodgings by his landlord David Fino whose newspaper kiosk was nearby. Five days later, his friend Franz Overbeck arrived in Turin and escorted Nietzsche to Basel in Switzerland. And it was there, in the asylum, that Nietzsche was institutionalised and the story of his misdiagnosis begins. Paretic syphilis is a form of syphilis whose symptoms can develop between 10 and 30 years after initial infection. Paretic syphilis leads to the degeneration of the brain's tissues and culminates in a form of paralytic dementia. When first developing, it usually manifests in the form of fatigue, headaches, insomnia and dizziness. As it progresses, mental deterioration and personality changes occur, leading to a loss of social inhibition, gradual impairment of judgement, concentration and short-term memory, as well as experiences of euphoria, mania, depression or apathy. As well as these, delusions also become common as the disease progresses. Dr. Houston Merritt, the leading 20th century authority on syphilis, identified five distinctive signs used to specifically diagnose paretic syphilis. An expressionless face, hyperactive tendon reflexes, tremor of the tongue and facial muscles, impairment of handwriting and slurred speech. The telltale symptom for paretic syphilis is the tremor of the tongue. Shortly after arriving at the asylum in Basel, Nietzsche was examined and the doctor who was working under the assumption that this new patient was just another case of paretic syphilis was startled to observe the absence of this symptom. Tongue heavily furred. No deviation. No tremor. But that's not all. Of the other four distinctive symptoms of the illness, Nietzsche displayed not a single one. His speech remained intact, his face was, if anything, overly animated with excitement. He was known to play piano for up to a year after his breakdown, and when Arthur Muthman, a psychiatrist at the Basel Asylum, analysed Nietzsche's journal after his death, he found it to be completely unlike anything he had ever seen written by a patient with paretic syphilis. Muthman concluded that the notebooks alone were sufficient evidence to reject the diagnosis of paretic syphilis. All of which raises the puzzling question of why exactly Nietzsche got diagnosed with this condition. And for this there are a number of contributing factors. Firstly, it's worth mentioning two contextual points it's important to take into account. The first is that paretic syphilis was a common label at the time, and was a broad diagnostic category that functioned as a default diagnosis. It wasn't until 1906 that a sure test for the disease was discovered. When this Wasserman test was first introduced, the number of patients thought to suffer with syphilis dropped from 30% to only 8-9% to in one German clinic. So syphilis was not as widespread as commonly believed, and the advanced stage Nietzsche was supposed to have is rarer still, developing in only 2-4% to of syphilitic patients. But these facts didn't come to light until much later as medicine advanced. In 1889, there was no Wasserman test and paretic syphilis was a common diagnosis. The second contextual point to keep in mind is that Nietzsche was far from a celebrity at the time of his breakdown. When he first arrived in the asylum in Basel in January 1889, he was a non-entity. When he was moved to Jena Asylum in Germany at the request of his mother, he was put in a large, open, second-class ward as his mother couldn't afford first-class treatment and a private room. Second-class patients didn't ordinarily receive any particular attentions from the staff and Nietzsche received none. The outward appearance of his illness, a man in his mid-forties with dementia, was far from exception. So in seeking to understand how a man who exhibited none of the telltale signs of paretic syphilis got stuck with the label, these are the first two things to keep in mind. First, it was a common, almost default diagnosis, and second, Nietzsche's family were not wealthy enough to demand that he get a closer examination. 
In fact, the rather amazing truth is that his family weren't even told about this diagnosis until after his death. It was only then that the syphilis diagnosis leaked into the public sphere as Nietzsche's celebrity grew. Lacking these defining symptoms, it is amazing that Nietzsche was diagnosed with the disease, and even more amazing that it has become so entrenched in history. The only abnormal physical finding in his examination was an asymmetry in the size of his pupils. The right pupil was larger than the left and reacted sluggishly. On the basis of this, combined with his grandiose delusions and the development of dementia, Nietzsche was diagnosed with paretic syphilis. The assumption made by the physicians was that these symptoms were newly developed. But if they had taken the time to question his medical history, the case for the diagnosis would have fallen apart. Nietzsche's eyes had plagued him his whole life. At the age of five, they were examined by a professor Schellbach of Jena University, who found that he suffered from a myopia that was much more severe in his right eye than his left. He also noted that the young boy's right pupil was significantly larger than his left. And so this discrepancy in his pupils that contributed to his diagnosis 40 years later was far from a recent development. As for his grandiose delusions, these were nothing new for Nietzsche. This is the man who five years earlier had written to a friend that his book Thus Spoke Zarathustra was the most significant book of all times and peoples that ever existed. That same year he wrote that if I do not go to such extremes that whole millennia will make their highest vows in my name, then in my eyes I will have accomplished nothing. And so, diagnosing him with paretic syphilis based on newly developed grandiose delusions was another diagnostic oversight that would likely have been avoided had Nietzsche's family been wealthy enough to afford close attention. The third cause of his diagnosis was his dementia. But while dementia was most commonly explained at that time by paretic syphilis, there are many more explanations which have been presented as alternative diagnoses of Nietzsche's illness, such as a benign tumour of some variety. As Leonard Sachs has stated in his article on Nietzsche's case, on balance, it appears that the diagnosis of paretic syphilis in Nietzsche's case was made in spite of, not because of, the clinical evidence. The diagnosis was the result of a cursory examination, of the failure to investigate his medical and psychiatric history, and of the assumption, understandable enough in 1889, that dementia in a middle-aged man could safely be assumed to be paretic syphilis. Though the syphilis misdiagnosis seems easy to dispel now, it was far from the case at the start of the 20th century. When the diagnosis first emerged, Nietzsche's sister Elizabeth, who was the head of his estate, feared that her brother's reputation would be forever stained. To avoid this, she enlisted the most notorious science writer of the day, Dr. Paul Mobius, to examine the case. But Elizabeth's attempt backfired. Mobius quickly sided with the physicians and traced the beginnings of Nietzsche's syphilis back to 1881's Thus Spoke Zarathustra, despite the fact that the vast majority of paretic syphilis cases end in death within two years, while Nietzsche survived an unprecedented two more decades. Mobius concluded his work on Nietzsche's illness by warning people away from his works. Beware, he wrote, for this man has a diseased brain. The next examination of the case was by Kurt Hildebrandt in 1926, where he questioned the many inconsistencies of the diagnosis and was the first to remark that a slowly growing benign tumour would be consistent with Nietzsche's case. His book was followed by that of Eric Podak in 1930, who launched an attack on Mobius's book and drawing on Nietzsche's medical records pointed to the haphazard and casual manner in which Nietzsche's diagnosis was made. But Hildebrandt and Podak's doubts did not become popular. Podak's work was attacked by Wilhelm Lange Eichbaum, a German neurologist and admirer of Mobius who was famous for his 1928 book on the connection between genius and insanity, in which he called Shakespeare a psychopath and Jesus a mental case. Lange Eichbaum savagely attacked Podak's book, calling it the grotesque work of a layman. It was Lange Eichbaum that originated the story about Nietzsche's supposed escapade in a Leipzig brothel in his early 20s. He claimed to have heard this from a Berlin neurologist, but it turns out that this Berlin neurologist had gotten the story from none other than Dr. Mobius, who supposedly had letters from two Leipzig doctors who had treated Nietzsche in 1867. But these letters were never seen by anyone but Mobius, who said that they had since been destroyed. Astonishingly, this single passage about the brothel escapade from Lange Eichbaum's book is the chief foundation cited again and again, directly or indirectly, as proof that Nietzsche had syphilis. When Richard Blunk published his biography of Nietzsche in the 1950s, he cited this passage in his discussion of Nietzsche's descent into madness, noting that The year when the infection occurred remains undetermined, but we cannot doubt the report of such a sincere psychiatrist as Lange Eichbaum. And because Blunk's work was for the most part well documented, his endorsement of Lange Eichbaum's story carried considerable weight, 
and because of the rareness of the book, there were few scholars that could check Langa Eichbund's work directly, and so they merely cited Blunk. The sloppiness of this work is summed up beautifully by Leonard Sachs in his article. One man's gossip becomes another man's reference, which in turn becomes a scholar's footnote. Through Blunk, the two most prominent Nietzsche biographers, R.J. Hollindale and Walter Kaufman, found it impossible to doubt that Nietzsche was treated for a syphilitic infection by two Leipzig doctors during 1867. And that is the wayward tale of how Nietzsche's misdiagnosis got tied up with the story of a brothel and enshrined in the history books. Had it not been for Lange Eichbaum's work, then Podak and Hildebrand's counterarguments could have brought the truth of the misdiagnosis to light as early as 1930. But instead, it took another 70 years for the works of Eva Cybulska in 2000 and Leonard Sachs in 2002 to dethrone the myth. All of this leaves us with one final question. What did Nietzsche really die of? Without exhuming his body, it's now impossible to know for sure and there is no consensus on what exactly was the cause. In her article for the medical journal Hospital in 2000, Cybulska argued that the most likely hypothesis for Nietzsche's breakdown was bipolar disorder, which she traces throughout his career. And in his pivotal article in 2002, Leonard Sachs argues for the brain tumour hypothesis. Another suggestion that was favoured by Nietzsche's mother was that his illness was brought on, or at least exacerbated, by his chronic drug use, since Nietzsche was taking a wide variety of drugs to help him deal with his migraines and many other afflictions. These ranged from chloral hydrate and bromide to opium hashish and a mysterious Javanese preparation. And finally, there are others who argued that Nietzsche's condition was a purely psychological one, brought on by his thinking dangerous thoughts. It seems that the mystery of Nietzsche's condition is destined to remain an enigma. His illness and his demise is archetypally tied up with his legend. While his illness may not have been caused by his dangerous thoughts, it is archetypally and symbolically married to it. The shadow of madness and danger is threaded throughout Nietzsche's work and his advocacy of being a free spirit and thinking dangerous thoughts embrace the great risk of falling into the unfathomable abyss. In section 29 of Beyond Good and Evil, he writes an aphorism that epitomises the danger and his willingness to risk it. Independence is for the very few. It is a privilege of the strong. And whoever attempts it, even with the best right but without inner constraint, proves that he is probably not only strong but also daring to the point of recklessness. He enters into a labyrinth. He multiplies a thousandfold the dangers which life brings with it in any case. Not the least of which is that no one can see how and where he loses his way, becomes lonely, and is torn piecemeal by some minotaur of conscience. Supposing one like that comes to grief, this happens so far from the comprehension of men that they neither feel it nor sympathise, and he cannot go back any longer, nor can he go back to the pity of men. This reads like an extended paraphrase of the inscription that Dante finds over the entrance to hell. Abandon all hope, ye who enter here. And it's not hard to connect the message of this aphorism with the impenetrable labyrinth that Nietzsche entered into in the Piazza Carlo Alberto on that fateful January morning in 1889. That's everything that I wanted to cover on this episode of The Living Philosophy. If you've enjoyed it, please subscribe if you haven't already. Give us a thumbs up down below if you enjoyed the video and... Yeah, if you have any thoughts, insights or feedback, I'd love to hear from you down below. Otherwise, I shall see you next time. Thank you for watching.